So today we ask the question, who is the Christian? What is it that makes someone a Christian? What does that entail? Is it merely assenting to the right things? Yes, I believe X, Y, Z, you know, do I believe the Apostles' Creed? Believe in God the Father, Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. If you're able to say that and believe it, does that make you a Christian? Maybe it's that you said a prayer sometime, you know, 20 years ago, and life never changed after that. Does that make you a Christian? Well, what we're going to look at today is really what I think is the defining aspect of what makes someone a Christian, and that is the new birth. What makes someone a Christian is that they are born again, we are born again to a living hope. And really, that'll be the first section, who the Christian is, that we're born again. And then for the rest of the sermon, what we'll look at is one important outflow of that, and that's that because of that, therefore, we're going to rejoice in all circumstances. So we're looking at who the Christian is, what makes you a Christian. And I submit that what Peter is talking about here in the opening parts of his letter is that a Christian is one who has been given the gift of regeneration. They have the new birth. And because of that, uh, we are to rejoice in every single circumstance of this life. This is what we're going to look at today. So let's look at the passage. We'll read it. I'll pray. And then we'll start walking through the text. 1 Peter 1, 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the suffering of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves but you in the things they now have, that now have been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we come before you humbled that we can sit Hear your word, hear the very words of God. I pray that uh, those that are the words of God will be upheld today and that you would cast aside those that aren't. Uh, Be with me now, anoint me with the spirit, I pray. I ask that sinners would be saved, that there would be some even today that experience the new birth, we pray. And that the church would be built up even as we seek to rejoice in all things. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. So to begin with, we're going to look at who the Christian is. And as I said, the Christian is one who is born again or born anew. And without this being born again, without this new birth, you are not a Christian. This is vital. This is important. This is one of the defining aspects of who a Christian is. As we get to verse 3, we'll notice that this is the opening of the main body of Peter's first epistle. And he begins with sort of a thesis statement for this coming section. And really, this is the governing principle for what we're going to be looking at. And it goes like this. Beginning in verse 3, you can look at it in your Bibles. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so we see the theme of this section is one of worship. We are giving blessings to the Lord. And as we will see, this will soon be shown in our rejoicing. So as we walk fairly quickly through this text, we need to remember that the context to this is declaring the blessedness of God the Father. We're standing in awe of what he has done and what he has changed us into, and we're declaring our response to him. So, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And what are we to bless the Lord for, according to this text? Well, it's because of his mercy. Look along in verse 3. It says, according to his great mercy. It's great mercy. 
His mercy is not normal. It's not merely adequate mercy. It's great. It's truly beyond comprehension. And what I hope that you get a sense of today as we kind of walk through this first part of the text that we're going through today is to get a sense of the greatness of the mercy of God in the fact that we are born again out of death into life, into a living hope that is amazing. It's great. Truly, it's beyond what we can properly comprehend. And what did his mercy do? As we walk through the text, it's good to ask questions and we say, okay, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, why do we bless him? Well, it's according to his mercy. Okay, well, what was his mercy? And here it is. We're going to camp out here for just a little while. End of, or middle of verse three. He has caused us to be born again to a living hope. He has caused us to be born again to a living hope. And really the Greek language, is a, it's a fantastic language, it really is, especially a Koine Greek in which the, the New Testament was written. And it's interesting that all these words that we have to translate into English, he has caused us to be born again, is actually one word in the Greek. And it's one word that embodies every single aspect of what I just said. And so we have the male pronoun there, he, we have the causal effect, he has caused us, we have the born again, so it's not just that he has caused us to be born, no, he has caused us to be reborn, or you could even say beget again, and it really is fantastic in the way that it can take just this one word and have all of that rolled up into this one concept. And the translation of the ESV is a good one, when it says, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope. There is a causal aspect to it. You see, we don't give ourselves the new birth. This isn't something that comes from us. It's not something we can force God to do. This is something absolutely caused by God. And it's also a rebirth. It's not talking about our first birth, but the word is begetting again. It's a second time. Now, we do hear this phrase often, don't we? We say, oh, I'm a born-again Christian. Are you born again? What does it mean to be born again? We hear this again and again and again. And one thing that worries me is that when we use words often, it can come to lose the significance of what it is. And to be born again, one, it's actually a very strange statement, right? Nicodemus gets that when we look at the other place where the born again motif is used, and that's when Jesus uses it in his conversation with Nicodemus in John chapter 3. I'm going to read that for you because Nicodemus understands that this is strange, right? Jesus is talking about being born again. So John 3, 3 says this, Jesus answered him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. And so we learn from Jesus that if you are not born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus is confused, and he says, well, that's strange. How in the world am I to be born again? Do I enter the womb again? And what, like... Jesus, how does this work out? And so what we have here is Peter taking the born again motif and using it as Jesus did. Being simply born of water or born as a baby is not enough to inherit the kingdom of God. And really, what does this go against? This goes against universalism. This goes against everyone being saved just because they are here. This is not how God operates. Being born, or hear me, even being born of a specific race or a specific family is not enough to be part of the kingdom of God. It's not enough to even call yourself a Christian. No, we must be born of the Spirit. It's a spiritual birth. One where our spirit is made anew. And the theological term for this, and you might have heard it before, is regeneration. So if you hear the term regeneration by some pastor, then know that they're talking about the new birth. They're talking about being born again. And noticed in Peter what it leads to at the end of verse 3. What are we born into? Well, according to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again, spiritually made alive to what? To a living hope. One, it's a living hope, right? We are brought into life. We enjoy new life. 
As Ephesians 2 states, we are no longer dead in our trespasses and sins. Why? Because we need to be born again to a new hope. We were dead, we need to be born again spiritually to a new hope. Also, there is hope there. And this is hope both in this life and in the next. There's both a future aspect and a present aspect to the living hope that we have. In fact, in the Greek, it's what we call the present tense, which has a continuous feel to it. It's always happening. And so when Peter comes and he says, according to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope, he's saying you are always in that living hope, both now and for eternity, though the hope will be eventually completely realized in the future. This is what we're talking about. The new birth brings a hope that is alive and living. But where does it come from? Well, we move along. Verse 4, sorry, just before verse 4, end of verse 3. Born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So, the power that rose Christ from the dead is the power that brings us to new life. And because Christ is risen, we have a guarantee of our living hope. And so what he's doing is he's grounding the living hope that we have, the fact that we are born again, we're no longer spiritually dead, we are alive in Christ, all that is grounded in the resurrection. Christ isn't dead, therefore you're not dead. That's what he's saying. He is no longer dead, and we too are no longer dead in our trespasses and sins. We have become spiritually alive in Christ, and one day we will be physically as well as we gain new bodies that will never die. I remember one time having a conversation with a friend who thought that the resurrection wasn't absolutely necessary. And we had this argument. In fact, he thought that once Christ died on our behalf, that was good, right? Like he died for our sins. Our sins at that point were taken care of. Everything's good. The, the resurrection was just the great thing that happened. It's the exclamation mark. It's not important. Well, according to this text, the resurrection is absolutely necessary. The resurrection is what leads to our new life. Without the resurrection, there is no new birth. It says, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. It is the power that rose Christ from the dead is the power that brings us spiritually alive and into the kingdom of God. And so according to this text, it's absolutely necessary. Obviously, there's other texts. 1 Corinthians 15 makes it very clear it's necessary. Um, But if anyone ever tells you that the resurrection isn't necessary, tell them, no, 1 Peter 1 Three says it's absolutely necessary. The hope, then, is described in two ways. First, it's described as an inheritance. We are born again to an inheritance. And obviously, the theme of inheritance is strong through the Bible, right? Just think of the children of Israel. What was their inheritance? Their inheritance was the promised land. They were to go and inherit the promised land, and that's what they did. But eventually, they lost it and then got it back. So the children of Israel were given an inheritance in the promised land, and this is what was promised to them. But Christians are promised the entire world. But more than that, in having an inheritance, we become an heir with the Lord. We become an an heir, a co-heir with Christ. Now some in this passage will argue that this inheritance is strictly a future thing. It's only talking about uh, when Christ returns and we're at the judgment. Some would argue that. And obviously, an inheritance comes into completion at the end, but for a few reasons, I believe that this inheritance is ours even now, though not fully. Our inheritance will come fully to to fruition once our salvation is fully to fruition, which is uh, when we are uh, passed over at judgment, which we'll see. And so one reason why I think that we are partially in our inheritance right now is that the word to can also be seen as into So we are brought into the inheritance. So right now we're bringing into the inheritance. And then second, the phrase to an inheritance is linked to the verb cause to be born again, which is in the present tense. And so all this is currently happening. And as I said, there's a continuous aspect to that. But that doesn't mean that it's fully now ours. We are fully heirs with Christ, right? But we haven't fully gained our inheritance yet. As we will see, it is to be revealed in the last time. But we are currently heirs with Christ. And in a way, we have this inheritance now in seed form. 
But what I want you to notice, and this is vital, even as we lead into the rejoicing section, is that the inheritance, the living hope, and the salvation are all sure. They are completely steadfast. If you have been born again to a living hope, it is sure. Notice what it says in verse 4. So to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. So this inheritance that is yours if you are born again is imperishable. That's strong language. The living hope does not perish. The inheritance does not perish. It is forever. If you have been born again, your hope is sure. It is undefiled. It cannot be corrupted. It is your, if it is yours, if Christ has given that to you, if you have been given the gift of regeneration, then it will not be corrupted. It is undefiled. It has been placed in heaven for you. And it's interesting that this is the first time that Peter switches from the plural us and our to the more personal pronoun you. So notice he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord, according to his great mercy, has caused us to be born to a living hope. Then he gets to verse 4 and he says, To an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. He's making it very personal. He's essentially looking them in the eye and saying, If you are born again, if you have this living hope, this is kept in heaven for you. It will not fail. This is what he's saying. It will not fail. The inheritance is yours if you have been born again. But how do we know that it's sure? How do we know that it's truly imperishable? Well, Peter answers that question too. It's not through our power. No, it's not ultimately up to us if our inheritance comes to fruition. Look at the next line. To an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed at the last time. Who by God's power are being guarded. The word for guarded here is a military aspect to it. It's the same word that would be used of a garrison guarding a base in the Roman world. So you can think of is your inheritance has been placed in a base surrounded by an army that is impenetrable and no one is getting in there. This is the most secure place that could possibly be imagined. This is what Peter is getting at. And the word is one of completion. So the guard is set. It's completed. It's in the past. It's as good as done. In fact, it's not as good as done. It is done. And as I said, the word picture that Peter is painting is one of our inheritance, our living hope, our salvation being placed in the safest place with a legion guarding it. All through God's power. In other words, it cannot be more sure. What is our part? Well, we must have faith. And so we see this to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you who by God's power are being guarded through faith. It's guarded through faith. We learn in other places, such as Ephesians chapter 2, that faith is a gift of God. But yes, we must have faith in God. We are saved through faith alone, by grace alone, in Christ alone. I think Thomas Schreiner said it very well. He says it like this, God's power protects us because his power is the means by which our faith is sustained. God's power protects us because his power is the means by which our faith is sustained. So that is how his power is acting through our faith, which is what the text is saying. And then Peter switches language here and he actually calls the inheritance salvation through faith for a salvation and yes when i ask the question what are we saved from a lot of times we'll hear the term yeah we're saved from our sins and that's true we are saved from our sins but it is much more than that because it's ready to be revealed at the last time that's what it says next who by god's power are being who by god's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed at the last time the salvation will be completely revealed at the last time, at the end. Now, so in the last days, at the judgment of God, 
God's salvation will be revealed. And what is it salvation from? Well, Romans 5.9 makes this very clear. In Romans 5.9, Paul says this, Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved from him, by him, from the wrath of God. What are we saved from? We're saved by God from God's wrath. So how is salvation revealed in the last time? Salvation is revealed in the last judgment when we've been covered in Christ's righteousness and we are not judged for our sins but are given our inheritance. And this is the great mercy of God. So in being born again, what happens is our status changes so that when we come before God in the judgment and what we truly deserve for the wages of sin is death, what we truly deserve is to go to hell for our sins for eternity. We have sinned against a holy God, and that is what we deserve. But because of God's great mercy, what happens? We are saved. How are we saved? Well, God looks on us. He sees someone who is born again, who is no longer a sinner, but is covered in the righteousness of Christ. And instead of giving us what we deserve, he hands us our inheritance. And we are now heirs with Christ, and we inherit the world. It's an amazing thing. And Peter is saying here that it is absolutely sure. It's undefiled. It is imperishable. It's being guarded by legions so that this will happen if you are truly born again. It's amazing. We're born again to a living hope through Christ's resurrection to an inheritance that is sure, guarded by God so that through faith our salvation will be shown to be sure at the final judgment. Now, the main application for this sermon will come a little bit later, but the big one here is to ask the question, are you born again? Do you have this living hope? Do you have your salvation safeguarded by the power of God? You need faith in Christ. If you haven't done it, you need to put your faith in Christ. He died on the cross for your sins. He rose again, and the same power that rose Christ from the dead will make you born again. Essentially, you need to run to Jesus. And if that's you, I implore you, today is the day of salvation. Turn to Christ. Put your faith in Christ. Even now or after the service, come talk to someone. We'd love to talk to you more about it. You need to run to Jesus. You need the new birth, and the only person that can give you the new birth is God himself. And so you beg him for it. And I pray that everyone here, no one would leave here without experiencing this themselves. And so we've seen who the Christian is. The Christian is one who is born again. This is the essential, the essential thing that makes someone a Christian. Your life is now changed because God has given you regeneration. You now have faith in him. And so we have a response here for the rest of the passage. And that's this. Therefore... The Christian is one who rejoices. Peter next moves to a response of the Christian to these amazing truths. And that is to rejoice. The Christian is one who rejoices. This should be the default disposition of someone who follows Christ, someone who truly has the living hope within them. And this is no matter the circumstances. And in fact, he gives three circumstances in which rejoicing in our blessed hope is absolutely appropriate. And really, I think these three circumstances show um, a way of saying in all circumstances. Okay? The first one's a big one. And it's really a theme throughout the letter of First Peter. And that is in suffering. The first circumstance to rejoice in is suffering. And when we look at verse 6, it says this, In this you rejoice. Well, let's first ask the question, what does he mean by in this? Well, in this, I believe, is referring to uh, verses 3 to 5. It's not any specific aspect in there. He's really referring to the whole thing. And so it's our living hope, our being born again, our inheritance that doesn't perish, all these things, for this reason, in this, you rejoice. But it's interesting that in that same sentence, because of the situation of these Christians, he barely takes a breath and he says this, in this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. And so he's saying, look, I know what it's like for you. I know that you are grieved right now. 
I know that it is very hard. I know that you are suffering. But the call of a Christian is still in this, in the new birth, in the living hope, in the inheritance, and in the salvation. The call of the Christian is to rejoice. Now, a few things to know about trials and suffering from this little phrase here. First, a Christian's response to trials is to rejoice. We've gone over that. Second, it says this, now for a little while. So he says, in this you rejoice, though now for a little while. In other words, it too will pass. But the hope is not in its passing in this life, because when we say a little while, and you take that little while, and you stretch it against eternity, your entire life could be a little while. And so what this is saying is not a promise that in three days your trials are going to go away. This is saying in the grand scheme of things, if you truly have the living hope within you, this will be a little while. This will pass. And in the end, it will be worth it. Peter's like, I promise. Okay? It's for a little while. It too will pass. And that might not necessarily be this life. It could be the next. Third, and I find this very interesting... It happens if necessary. And so when you're going through very hard things, it's not fate or the winds of the world that controls what's happening to you. It's not even random chance that's just coming down and you're like, man, I got unlucky today. No. What Peter says here is, if necessary, this is happening. So if you are going through trials right now, if you're suffering right now, if as the people here are grieved, if that's you right now, then you're going through the trials because in some way that we cannot possibly understand necessarily, it is necessary. And we'll actually get into that reason why it's necessary in a little bit in the text. So I'm going to move on, even though I'm sure some of you are like, necessary, what in the world? Okay, lastly, just from this phrase... As we're looking at what are things we can see about trials. So we looked at, yes, we're to rejoice. Yes, it's for a little while. Yes, it's going to be necessary. But finally, they are grieved. Okay? Because look at what it says. It says, in this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. It's not that they are flippantly ignoring the trials. It's not that they're just burying it down and saying, I'm going to ignore everything that's happening to me. It is grievous. They are wounded. I'm sure they are mourning and weeping and wondering how in the world they're going to make it through. It hurts. And it can be almost unbearable. And this is okay. In fact, when you read through the Psalms, you'll see that the lament psalm, the psalm of crying out to God in hard times, becomes one of the most um, numerous psalms in the Psalter. Why? Because we need that language. But it's grievous. It hurts. It can be unbearable. But I want you to understand is that the command that I'm saying to rejoice is not at odds with being grievously hurt and mourning. They can be together. And we'll get into that. Okay? So knowing of our living hope is the reason that we can rejoice in all situations. And here the text is focusing on rejoicing even though we are facing trials. It could be a trial that is very short or one that lasts a lifetime, but the call of the Christian who truly has a living hope is to rejoice even when things are very, very hard. Now, Peter gives a reason that the trials might be necessary. And he says it right here. So look at verse 7. But I'll read verse 6 again. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that... So he's saying, so that, in other words, if it's necessary, this is the reason why it's necessary, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in the praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So what are trials? Why do we suffer sometimes? Trials are a test of faith, is what this passage is saying. 
I've heard this said, suffering and trials is the crucible for faith. What it does is it gets rid of all the fluff and it shows what is truly there. So if through suffering there is absolutely no joy, there is no perseverance, then it shows a faith that was not genuine. But if you persevere through suffering and you have a joy through it, something that is really supernatural and comes with the new birth, then the result is amazing. And he gives the result, right? That it may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's amazing to know that when we persevere through trials, that we have a prize, and ultimately that prize is Christ itself. And in us being able to persevere through the trials, what happens is Christ gets the glory, but in a very small way, we even get a little bit of that. And what Peter does is he gives this gold motif in that as gold is refined by the fire and has the potential to be destroyed if it's not pure, so trials and suffering refine the Christian and show if they are true or not. And so we rejoice in our suffering because of our living hope. Our hope isn't in this life, and in rejoicing in our suffering, we prove that our hope isn't in this life. It's easy to rejoice when things are going well. It's like, man, the Lord gave me a mansion, a private jet, and five billion dollars. This is amazing. Man, the Lord loves me. But what happens when the only thing you have is the ability to fall on your knees before him and cry out to him? What happens then? Oh man, the Lord must hate me. Well, if that's your attitude, no. The attitude of the Christian, no matter the circumstance. Yes, if you're doing well, rejoice in the Lord. It's awesome. But if you're suffering, the underpinning of what your disposition needs to be is one of rejoice, even as you mourn, as we'll get into a little bit later. And so we rejoice in our suffering. The next thing that we're able to rejoice in, according to this text, is in knowing Christ. We rejoice because of our living hope that we are ones that know Christ. And he goes on to say this. He says in verse 8, Though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. So, though you have not seen him, you love him. And these people that Peter is writing to have actually never physically seen the risen or pre-risen Christ, most likely. They knew people like Peter who had been with Christ, but like us, they'd never actually seen him. But through the power of the Spirit, they love Christ, even though they have never seen him personally. And then the rest of verse 8 says, though you have not seen him, you believe in him. And so loving and believing are not through physical sight. And these people rejoice because they know Christ even though they have not seen him. And as God's power brings about belief and love, this brings about rejoicing as you seek greater things. And it says, and rejoice with joy that is an inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. And so knowing Christ and loving him and believing in him will bring about the outcome of your faith. So because of the hope that is within us, the living hope, we know Christ and we rejoice. And then finally, Peter's going to look at this, the salvation of your souls and he's going to delve into salvation a little bit more as we look at the Old Testament. We rejoice in the living hope that we have, because we are on this side of the cross, we've actually seen the fulfillment of the Old Testament, which is amazing. Look at verse 10. Concerning this salvation... So this thing that we have, we get this salvation. And concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully. Notice how the prophets were prophesying about what the people in Peter's time had obtained through the grace of God and what we have the ability to obtain through the grace of God. Think of all the prophecies of Christ throughout the Old Testament. You can see the narratives and how the themes point to Christ. You can see the actual prophecies that have direct links to Christ. But everything in the Old Testament points to Jesus in some way. We don't have time to do it here today to go over them. 
But you know what? It would be a great thing to do. We, I mean, we could do it, but it would be like a normal sermon series, right? You know, five to ten years. <laughs> but one thing you could do is, in your quiet time, just get a list of the prophecies that point to Christ, and then understand that as the prophets were writing that, as they were writing that, you have more of a picture of what that looked like. They saw it not clearly. We get to see it clearly because we're on this side of the cross, and we can rejoice in that. We can rejoice in that. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you, is what the text says. They gave the words so that we could know the Messiah has come. And we've seen the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. And even Jesus talks about this in Matthew 13. Matthew 13, 16 to 17, Jesus says this, But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For truly I say to you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not see it. And so it was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you and the things that they now have. And they've been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you. That's verse 12 of First Peter. And so the good news that was preached to the New Testament church is now compiled in the Holy Scriptures that we have. We actually have a completed canon of Scripture. We have the things announced beforehand and the narratives and themes and prophecies of the Old Testament, and we have the teachings of Christ and the apostles in the New Testament. It's amazing, and this we can rejoice in. But notice where these things come from right here at the end. In verse 12, it says, Preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. This is amazing. We know what's come from the Holy Spirit. And even so, it says this interesting phrase at the end, things into which angels long to look. So even the angels want to know about the good news that we have. They don't experience it like we do. They see it from afar and they look down. We get a look at a living hope that was given to us by a loving God, and we get to experience that in a way that the angels look into, and they long to look at that, but they can't. Our living hope of being born again causes us to rejoice. We can rejoice in all circumstances. So the main point of application for today, obviously, is for Christians to rejoice. And what I want to do is really focus more on the if you're going through a trial aspect today. So are you going through a trial right now? Maybe it's a very tough one. Maybe there's no end in sight. The call is to look to your future reward and regardless of your situation now, you're to rejoice. You're to come to church every week and sing songs with the saints at church, whether you feel like it or not. It's how you rejoice. It's partly how you rejoice. You're to get together with your small group or with other believers, and you're to praise the Lord there. Now, you can weep, yes, but there needs to be a joy that is underlying it because of the hope that is within you. And one thing I've learned over the years is that in the Christian life, there is oftentimes both mourning and rejoicing happening at exactly the same time. We can see that in one hour we go to a house that has heard about a sickness or a suffering, a loss, and we weep with them, and then the next hour we go to a house that just witnessed a birth and you're rejoicing with them. And if you are in a church, there will be an aspect of rejoicing and mourning happening all the time. But, and this is important, the undergirding of it all needs to be rejoicing. The undergirding isn't the mourning. We're told to mourn. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Yes. But the comfort comes after the mourning, and the joy is there. Why? Because we have the living hope. Okay? We have been born again to a living hope. And so it is okay to mourn, it is okay to weep, it is okay to experience hard times and not know how you're going to go through the next day. But in the midst of that, there should be joy. Let me give you an example. 
As many of you know, my mom passed away recently. We had the funeral here, and in the funeral, there was definitely mourning the loss of my mom. It happened in this very room. But at the very same time, there was also rejoicing knowing that she had a living hope. So at the same time, in the same room, while people are crying and other people, well, there wasn't much laughing happening at that time, though there was laughter happening throughout that week. We had both mourning and rejoicing. But in the end, the rejoicing in the Lord needs to underpin the Christian life. And so that, yes, you go through circumstances that you don't understand. And you go through circumstances that are very hard and you mourn for that. And you're like, I, I don't even know how I'm going to go through the next day. But at the very same time, you understand what Peter is teaching here, which is that we are born again to a living hope. And so under all that, under it, you're like, you know what? I can rejoice in the Lord. And this is what we need to do. It's what a Christian does. We rejoice, we mourn, we suffer, but the undergirding of that is rejoicing. It also goes to show that the disposition of a Christian should not be like a mopey person that goes around frowning all the time. It shouldn't be someone that is always, you know, constantly down. If you indeed have a living hope in Christ, then people should see you as a rejoicing person. Now, what I don't want you to do is go find someone frowning and be like, dude, what are you doing? You got you to smile. What's, what's up? Because people will show joy and rejoicing in different ways. Okay? What I want you to do is I want you to think of your life, not other people's, your life, and say, what is the disposition of my life? Am I someone who's constantly down? Or am I someone who will look at the hope within me and have joy? Even in the hard times. This is the question that's being posed today. We want to be a rejoicing people. As Christians, we have been born again to a living hope. We have been given new life, and our hope is not just in this life, but in the life to come. We have been given an inheritance that is imperishable and will be guarded by the power of God till the last day when our salvation will be revealed. This is who the Christian is. The Christian is one who has been born of God. And what do we do because of this? Well, this passage tells us to rejoice. We are to rejoice in all circumstances, even when we experience suffering. The call today is to rejoice in the Lord. Yes, you can weep. Yes, you can mourn. Yes, you can grieve. But through it all, because of our living hope, we are to have a disposition of rejoicing. I pray that for you, and I pray that for me. Because as we do that, we are a witness to others that would ask the question, where is the hope within you? And then we're able to give a defense. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we are so thankful that those of us who have been born again have been born again to a living hope, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, that has been set in heaven, that is guarded by the power of God. What a truth, Lord, and I'm so thankful. I pray, Father, that you would be with us, that you would help us to rejoice I pray for those that are suffering right now that you would give them a heart of joy even in the midst of it, that they can rejoice and weep at the same time. Help us to stand alongside our brothers and sisters in this. For those that are here who have not been born again, they have not experienced a new birth, Father, I pray that you would give them that, that they would put their faith in Jesus and they would learn or be given the new birth such that they would have this living hope as well. Change their hearts, we pray. We ask all these things in Jesus' name.